Well, the Summer Olympic Games are well underway in Rio. Athletes from around the world are going for gold in the biggest international sporting competition. But is the Olympic movement still relevant and are the games worth all the trouble? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Rochelle Carey. It is without a doubt the biggest sporting event in the world. A competition unlike any other where dreams are made or broken in an instant. This year, the Brazilian city of Rio de Janeiro is hosting the Summer Olympic Games, a first for South America. There are more than 10,000 athletes competing in 306 different events, including a team made entirely of refugees. And their fans from around the world will be watching and cheering. But despite Brazil's colorful and carnival-like atmosphere, there have been controversies. Construction delays, a Russian doping scandal, the Zika outbreak, and protest have all been examples of the pol political and wider risks of hosting such a major sporting event. But every former host country has had its share of challenges, leading many to question if the Olympic Games are worth all the trouble. Let's take a look at how much the Olympics have changed since ancient times. The first written record of the Games dates back to 776 B.C. when a cook won the only event, a 192-meter race. The ancient Games were held every four years during a religious festival honoring the great god Zeus. But the modern Olympics truly took off as an international sporting event after 1924 with its official symbol of interlocking rings representing the five different continents. Since 1994, the Summer and Winter Olympic Games have been held separately and have alternated every two years. Now back to Rio. During the bidding process, Brazil insisted the event would bring much needed sustainable development to the city. But as with previous Olympic Games, many promises have been made to citizens of the host countries, promises yet to be delivered. Time to bring in our guests now in Northampton. Andrew Zimbalist, author of the book Circus Maximus, the economic gamble behind hosting the Olympics and the World Cup. And Bristol, Brian Clift, lecturer in the Department of Health at the University of Bath. And in Beijing, Jeff Ruffalo, director of Ruffalo Communications and author of the book Inside the Beijing Olympics. And welcome to all of you. Um, Jeff, I want to start with you. You have written that the Olympics are dead. It is a dying concept that no one wants to touch. Yet country after country does continue um, to touch it. So what do you mean by it's dying? It's the business plan that's dead. It's not the Olympic movement. I love the Olympic Games and I love these, the athletes that go and compete. The problem with the Olympic Games is it's grown to such enormity that cities can, certain, can just not host this event anymore. Think of Rio. Rio was budgeted at $9.1 billion. It has gone 15 times over budget. It is unsustainable. We are now looking at the death spiral of the Olympics as a business model. Not the Olympic movement, but the Olympics as a business has failed. And what you're going to see are more cities dropping out, such as, well, we've already seen Oslo. We've seen Boston. You're going to see Rome come out of 2024, leaving only a few cities left to bid. It's a business model that has failed the world, not the movement. Okay, and we will um, get back to that to dig down more on the numbers and the business model. First, though, I want to get uh, Brian's thoughts on this. Do you think that there is something about the Olympics, be it the finances, be it the movement, be it the athletes, anything? Do you think that there's any part of it that is on the decline? That's on the decline. Um, that's a tough question because at the moment it looks pretty much like everything's on the ascendancy rather than decline. Um, I'm hoping that uh, we see some revisions and, and we see some changes being made. And I think cities are starting to recognize that um, the, the economic impacts aren't as, as robust uh, as they would hope. Um, so I think we're going to start to see that, and we've seen that um, already with, with Hamburg, with Boston rejecting the games. 
Um, and I, I think to some degree we're going to see that continued from some countries and some cities, but there's, there's others that are, are keen to host the games, that are keen to, to bring these big mega events because of not just the economic impact, but the kind of international prestige, the opportunity to kind of galvanize a populace, instill political leadership, to become part of a, a kind of global cultural tradition. Um, all these things kind of feature, and, and I think you're going to see some struggle, but um, I can't imagine that that it's going to happen rapidly, um, and I can't imagine that, that the core drivers are, are going to slow, because um, despite all the problems, um, there's still a number of countries and cities that are willing to take the games. Uh, Mr. Zimbalist, Andrew, I'd like to ask you the same question that I asked the uh, the two other guests. Would you say that the Olympics are are on the ascendancy or on the decline? Uh, they're on the decline. The two previous speakers talked about some cities that have rejected the Olympics. Actually, it's much worse than that. Uh, San Moritz, Munich, Stockholm, Krakow, Toronto all have rejected the Olympics in the last couple of years, cities that were in the process of, of bidding and, and decided not to bid. The, the problem is that to, to host the Olympics these days, and I'll talk about the Summer Olympics, which are roughly twice as large as the Winter Olympics, economically speaking, to host the Olympics these days costs somewhere in the neighborhood of 15 to $20 billion. For some cities like Beijing in 2008, it cost more. In Sochi in 2014, it cost a lot more. Uh, but generally speaking, to host the Summer Olympics, you're looking at a 15 to $20 billion bill. The amount of revenue that comes to the host city from hosting the Olympics is somewhere in the neighborhood of three to four and a half billion dollars. So on the one side, you have costs, 15 to 20 billion. On the other side, you have revenues of three to four and a half billion dollars. There's a massive deficit there. Now, the, the IOC likes to claim that hosting the games brings such prestige and, and positive exposure to the host city that as a result, any short-term deficit, 10, 15 billion dollars, whatever it might be, will be more than made up for by long-term gains that come in the form of increased tourism, increased foreign investment, increased trade, increased physical fitness on the part of the local population. None of those things is empirically sustainable. Uh, a variety of scholarly uh, independent research over the last 10 years has found that there is no economic boost along any of those lines from hosting the Olympic Games. So uh, the idea that the business model doesn't work, it works fine for the IOC, it works fine for the Olympic movement, it doesn't work for the host cities. And that's why the host cities are, are dropping off. Now, in addition to those economic numbers, you have uh, a tremendous amount of, of social dislocation. In Beijing, over, well, over Andrew, a million people were, were Andrew, dislocated. Or, before we yeah. get to those issues, because we are going to yeah, touch on ahead. this, I want to just keep talking about the money and the business model for, um, for just a moment. Um, Jeff, sure. so, so Jeff, Andrew says that the business model does work for, for some people, um, but clearly there are huge sections of the country and a population that it doesn't work for. So why, why would a city want to host the Olympics? Well, part of it is, is uh, corporate social responsibility to your community and bringing in major events. It does bring in 500,000 people over a 20 day, day period or so, but the cost of moving 500,000 people to 22 different venues over 18 days is a logistical nightmare for cities like Rio that did not have the infrastructure in place. It is not about architecture. Don't think it's about big buildings. It's not. It's about the logistics of moving everyone to all the big buildings. For example, my company raised 15 billion with a B to bring the Olympic Games to Honolulu, Hawaii for 2024. Who would not want to go to Hawaii? Ultimately, though, we return the money to our sponsors and our funders back in Europe because we simply could not make the financial business model work. The, the amount of money that it takes to expand a subway to a velodrome or to this or to that that the IOC will mandate through the host city contract breaks the budget. You have no say in the matter. You can try to fight the IOC if you're the host city and say, oh, I don't want to do this, I don't want to do that, good luck. 
because once you sign the host city contract and the games belong to you, the IOC also comes along and says, we want this fountain, we want this park, we want this, we want that. And if you don't have the money in your budget to, to, to have that in your, uh, availability to the IOC, you're going to find the money somewhere. In the case of the United States, my country is broke by $19 trillion. We have no money. Plus, as, uh, because of the success of the 84 Olympics, there is no federal money that can go and support a Olympic bid committee to run an Olympics. You have to run around the world to find people to give you money, just like Mayor Garcetti is doing right now in Rio. But guess what? He's not going to be the mayor if they win for seven years from now. And Los Angeles is we stuck with this giant albatross called the Olympics. It is not 1984. It is 2024. And Los Angeles will sink from the weight of the debt that will be placed on their shoulders for 20 to 30 years, just as Montreal was. So, Brian, is what motivation is there to try to to change this business model, to try to make it worth, to make it worth sustaining these games? Yeah, I, th I think in purely in purely economic terms, it's it's really hard to justify the expenditure, uh, as Jeff just just discussed. Um, it's not adding up. Um, but I think there are there are things outside of the economic realm that that are a heavy influence, and a lot of it is born out of this kind of, I guess, this illusion uh, and this promise that the games represents, and people buy into that. And and when they begin to buy into it, you begin to get an insertion of a variety of motivations and rationales, and those include things like political leadership. The Rio Games is a classic example of uh, the Brazilian political ship, political leadership trying to express that it is a kind of global power. It is a political and economic player on the international scene. You have um, environmental dimensions. Uh, the Olympic Games in Rio are supposed to help address a lot of environmental concerns. And, and all of this is, is of course, um, economically linked. Um, and whether or not that's going to be achieved in the end, I, I, th I think now we would say no. Um, but over the course of the next five to ten years, maybe we see it happen. Um, and there's also cultural expressions. Um, the, the idea of the uh, Olympic Games, as kind of inspired be, by Pierre de Coubertin, is supposed to instill this notion of, of kind of peace and international cooperation. And, and that's something that um, is always going to be at play in, in, wanting the host of, uh, in wanting to host the Games because um, I think leaders and people in general want to believe that um, the Olympics can serve as a foundation uh, for, for working across um, national boundaries, which is, which is often a very difficult thing to do. Andrew, when did the, um, the Olympics become such an economic albatross around the necks of so many cities. When did this happen? Well, it happened gradually. Um, really, you, you, you might trace it back to, to 1920 in, in Antwerp. Um, a bunch of businessmen wanted to promote their businesses. They wanted to develop the facilities at their athletic club. Uh, and they, they bit off more than they could chew. And they, they end up having to borrow an enormous amount of money from uh, from the Belgium government. Uh, that was, of course, at a much smaller scale. What's happened over the years is that the number of events, the number of athletes, the number of venues, which is now for the Summer Olympics up to 35, plus you have to build an Olympic village, plus you have to build a broadcasting and media center. These numbers have just continued to grow and grow. And, and as we speak, uh, they're, they're growing again. Uh, this year for, for Brazil, they, they added the sports of rugby and golf. Uh, they're, they're, uh, they've already announced in the last couple of weeks that for, for Tokyo, they're going to be adding four additional sports, in, including baseball and softball. Uh, so the international sporting federations want to be part of the Olympics, and the, the IOC tends to accommodate them. Uh, and the number of athletes, the number of venues, the, the amount of demands and space that are required to do the Olympics just keeps on growing.
Ryan, let's keep talking about money, but let's talk about money now as it, re it relates specifically to the athletes, not the host cities or the host countries. What all does it take now financially to get into the Olympics? Put your skill aside, your talent aside. What, um, what has to happen for an athlete to even be able to consider going to the Olympics financially? Uh, it depends on where you want to start. Uh, if you're going to start um, from the kind of low teenage years where the Olympics become a possibility for some, you have to have an amazing training infrastructure behind you. You have to have a group of people to support you. That kind of social dimension, either your family or your friends, is a necessary condition of, of being successful in, in most cases. Uh, you have to have a federation that supports you and, and that offers uh, ways for you to train um, through f either facilities, equipment, um, uh, medical care, that sort of thing. And you have to be able to sustain that for so long um, that it becomes a, r a really unbelievable thing when somebody actually gets there because it, it does demonstrate that the level of investment uh, and especially bodily investment is is quite incredible, um, but it requires a number of people around you that all has a financial backing that is that is really significant. And some countries have more uh, capacity than others to fund that. Different countries fund that in different ways via uh, public support uh, or state support versus um, private investment and, and sponsorship. Um, so it changes by country, but um, certainly the backing, uh, the backing is, is nothing short of phenomenal um, when you look at, at who gets there based on what it takes. Jeff, what, what other real solutions or alternatives are out there for a way that you could see the Olympics to evolve? I've read somebody pitched the idea of maybe having um, having the events spread out over different countries over a longer period of time so that one city doesn't have to necessarily sustain so much. What what realistic possibilities have actually been discussed? There are two possibilities left with the Olympic movement. Number one, take it back to Athens, to the original, to Olympia. They certainly could use the money from the IOC and rebuilding their facilities that have left to rot. At one point, the, the Athens government, the Greek government, was paying a million dollars a month, one month, a million dollars, just to upkeep buildings that were empty. That's rubbish. Take it back to Olympia. Or number two, we have enough cities around the world in the last 20 years, you put the names in a hat, every seven years you pull one out. Atlanta, London, Rio, Beijing, the list goes on. Why would you do that? Because you have cost utilization in each of these cities. They have the facilities available. Why not reuse them again? Why in the world are we going around the planet as a traveling circus to take money from people in cities that are not ready to host an Olympic Games? Uh, Paris certainly might because they have the infrastructure, but there are a lot of cities like Rio that certainly aren't. Two choices left. And if you don't take one of these two choices, what is your third option? Now, what has the IOC done? They've come up with Agenda 2020, which is a basic concept to say, go ahead, reuse buildings, use temporary facilities. Again, they're missing the boat. It's not about the building. It's about moving the people to those buildings over a, an 18-day period, a half a million people or more all around your city, plus Look outside my window back there and take a look at the traffic. You have to manage all that. It's not about the buildings, it's about the logistics. I, so I'm, I'm of the, 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 the thought of going around the world to the cities who have already hosted, let them do it again. Andrew, is there a way, you said this, and this is the emotion that is played on every two years, that this is a way to help your city and, and you know, sit, neighborhoods that have been neglected, we can improve them, and, and that really never happens. Andrew, is there a way to make that happen? Is there a way that having the Olympics actually could benefit a city? I think there's an example where it's arguable that there was a significant benefit to a city, and that's the example of Barcelona, the Summer Olympics of 1992. What happened in Barcelona has not happened anywhere else. Uh, what happened in Barcelona was that after Franco died, 
1975, following four decades of, of ruling Spain, uh, the people elected democratic leaders and a discussion evolved in Barcelona about restructuring, re-envisioning the city. Uh, one of the things that happened during Franco's period was that there was a warehousing and manufacturing district that sprung up on the Mediterranean Sea for many, many blocks. And in essence, what it did was separate the downtown area of the city from the sea. So when they started democratically, popularly discussing what they'd want their city to look like going forward, they developed a plan to open the city to the sea. They wanted to move the warehousing and manufacturing district. Uh, they wanted to create a variety of new roadways. And they had a plan. They had a vision for their city. It developed in the late 1970s. After that plan was already in place, the idea came along that they could use the something like 75% of the required venues that they needed to host the Olympics, that they already had them and that two or three additional venues they were going to build anyway. So they had a plan where they were going to take the Olympics and fit it in to their vision for the city. They were going to make the Olympics work for their city. That reversed the standard, uh, the standard sequence. And all other cities that, that I've looked at, possibly excepting London, and we could talk about that later if you like, but in all other cities what happens is the city doesn't have a vision, it doesn't have a plan, uh, along comes the IOC and says, we want these 35 venues, we want this amount of ceremonial green space, this, this statue and this fountain, we want the Olympic Village, and so on and so forth. And we have to put them all in, in reasonable proximity to each other. And the city then contorts itself and twists itself in order to accommodate the IOC. When you do that, the infrastructural investments that you make and the venue investments that you make, and I disagree with, with Jeff who says it's all about logistics, it's not about building, it's about both of those things. Uh, when, when you twist and contort yourself, you end up spending billions of dollars to accommodate the specific needs of the IOC, having very, very little to do with the development needs of your city. So I think that Barcelona, although there were problems with Barcelona, Barcelona largely reversed the typical sequence and largely did it right, and it did help the development of Barcelona. So, Brian, we, we've, we're talking about these, these economic challenges and how the money, it sucks so much money out of cities as opposed to helping them. And then, of course, there's a discussion, particularly this year, with the decisions um, regarding dope, doping and testing. Um, what needs to happen as you see it? Because you were the most optimistic about the future of the Olympics. What do you think has to happen for the Olympics <laughs> to continue um, to evolve and for the spirit of the Olympics not to be tainted? I, I'm not sure if I'm the most optimistic, um, but I think recently I've tried to take a more balanced approach uh, <laughs> than previously. Um, I, I, I would agree uh, in many respects um, with what's been said already. The economic problematic is not going away. The logistical infrastructure is an absolute nightmare. Um, ideas about using one particular city in a given continent I think is a fantastic starting point for a discussion I think it's a really good idea I mean do, do you um, think the that problem, the do you think course, that the credibility of the Olympics is on the line I think the Olympics for the last 20 years has been up for debate about what it is and what it's for it's, it's not an athletic competition um, it is that, but it's so much more. It's, a, it's an opportunity for political expression. Whether the IOC wants to acknowledge that or not, it is. Um, it's an opportunity for urban redevelopment. It's an opportunity for cultural expression. It's all these things. Um, and I'm, I'm just not, um, I'm not convinced that it's on the line. The IOC has a tremendous amount of power, even though it's a non-governmental institution. Um, it's got tremendous influence, and I think everyone here has rightly pointed out a large problem is the IOC itself. Um, is the games on the line? I don't know. Uh, but is the IOC on the line? I, I think so, yeah. Okay, gentlemen, thank you very much for the discussion. I'm sure we will have it um, have it again sometime in the future as well. Um, thank you to um, all of our guests, Andrew Zimbalist, Brian Clift, and Jeff Ruffalo.
And thank you for watching. You can see the program again anytime if you go to our website. It's aljazeera.com. For further discussion, you can also go to our Facebook page. It is facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. And you can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Rochelle Carey, and the entire team here at Inside Story. Bye for now.